from peace to war. How did things go so badly, so quickly in the Middle East? Hey, everybody. I'm Steve Green with Bill Whittle and Scott Ott. This is Right Angle, brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. Uh, gentlemen, it, it, it seems like uh, only three years ago, in fact, it, it was only three years ago, that one of the greatest accomplishments of the Trump administration was put into effect, and that's the Abraham Accords, which are a series of bilateral agreements. The, the Trump administration, Mike Pompeo is Secretary of State, Jared Kushner is son-in-law and advisor, negotiated these as, a, as an honest broker, but they are bilateral agreements between Israel and various Arab countries, whichever ones wanted to sign on, establishing an official peace between nations that have been technically at war for all of Israel's modern existence. And what that means is trade and tourism and, and, and real relations between countries that were once bitter enemies. This, uh, everyone involved in this should have gotten their own Nobel Peace Prize, basically. Today, uh, the Abraham Accords seem to be on life support, along with an untold number of uh, dead Israeli civilians, kids, women, the works. Um, Bill, in your best estimation, how did things fall apart so quickly? I want to be crystal clear about this because this is a uh, this can be easily misinterpreted. So I'll say the same thing about this that I said about the invasion in Ukraine. The Biden administration did not cause the Russian invasion of Ukraine. However, a strong U.S. government, I, I personally believe, would have deterred that invasion. There's a difference between this is an act of omission and commission. Certainly, he didn't do anything during the four years of Trump as president. If the United States is perceived to be on the board actively enforcing agreements between two parties, then you generally tend to have relative stability. But when, but when it's clear that that's no longer the case, and especially when you, you trade, what was it, $6 billion released in funds for five American hostages? We talked about that uh, not too long ago. It's a billion dollars per American. It, it is, if, if you, the question you asked me was very specific. What changed? Right. I'm not saying that, I'm not making this as the case of how things got there. But what changed, in my opinion, what changed was that the was that the policeman was taking a break. That's what I think changed. Um, I don't know how much of this equipment has come from uh, Iran. I'm willing to bet virtually all of it. Um, and we continue to dance around the. And we have done this since 1979. We continue to dance around the fact that Iran has been at war with us and at war with Israel, but they've been at war with us since 1979. And we simply refuse to simply accept that and state it. Hamas is not capable of these kind of things on their own. When we release large amounts of money to Iran or, or things like that, then they don't go to feed the poor and starving. They go to buy weapons. The now, Bill, can I throw in the administration please. has already denied that, um, that in fact, uh, the administration has said that that money is still on deposit in, uh, I think it was Doha or Qatar. Um, and they haven't actually used any of it yet. There are such restrictions on it that it has to be used for humanitarian purposes. And basically, they haven't done the kind of paperwork required to access it. Now, of course, the counter argument to that is, as several presidential candidates have made, that money is fungible. And so if you know you've got $6 billion sitting in Doha, you can go ahead and spend $6 billion that you have elsewhere. But I just wanted to, out of fairness, extend this yeah. is what the I, administration is I appreciate is that. Fairness and accuracy are important. However, I am I'm inclined to agree with, with that argument because when they sold the lottery in California, they told us that would be millions and millions and millions of dollars for the education system, which in fact it was, but that meant that the millions that they would have put into the education system went somewhere else. And so it was, you know, it, it was just no net gain there. Look, I'm not blaming this on the United States. I, I am saying if you ask me what is different, that is my immediate reaction. Now, clearly, this... This attack has been planned for a long, long time, and we're all three doing shows on this this week, so I don't want to step on anybody else's shows or mine either. But I'll just close with this, Steve. I know whose side I'm on on this. 
But I think it has been a, a disease of the West for quite a long time now to believe that you can have that kind of emotional rage and turmoil within your boundaries of your territory and not have something come of it one day. And what I mean by that is that American cities are the same way. Inner cities in Chicago, Baltimore, all of these places, we've argued before about what causes them, and I have an opinion about that too. But this idea that we can, that we can section off these areas where people are so absolutely enraged and not deal with that is is problematic. I have a very clear opinion about how I feel about this and and who's on the, on the wrong side of this and and I think the thing is horrific and disgusting. So I don't really know what changed, but clearly somebody made the calculation, some people, groups, parties whatever, made the calculation that it was in their best interest now to go in and murder as many innocent people as they possibly could, when I'm sure that had been the intent, or at least the, the desire of many of these people for since 1948, but something had restrained them before, and what have, whatever had restrained them before is not in place now, and, and I think a significant amount of this also uh, has something to do with, I, I think, again, i got some things to say about this on my show, but looking at what happened and how it happened, to me, the first thing I think I could think of is that this is Israel's Pearl Harbor. That they that they got absolutely blindsided by the things that they yeah. should have been aware of, and and the, oh, the legendary, um, legendary Mossad and 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 all of those security services have clearly, clearly, clearly been allowed to, to decay to the to the same degree that our preparations in the in the uh, mid Pacific. Uh, were on December 6th of 1941. Yeah, let me, uh, again, in the interest of fairness, let me throw something in there. I just had an item go up on Instapunnet while we're talking, because I, I had it scheduled earlier in the day, that uh, one of the reasons Hamas was able to uh, achieve just strategic and operational surprise on this thing is that they didn't do any of their planning on the internet. Everything was face-to-face, -face, and Signals is intelligence is great. The stuff you get by tapping people's computers, satellite yep. spies, all of the rest. But there is no replacement for human intelligence. It's That's hard exactly. to get. It's dangerous to get. But you can't replace it either. Um, Scott, wow, uh, this this is difficult. We know the nature of this thing. It's uh, this. Israel's had three wars for its national existence. Uh, the first at its founding in 1947-48. The second. Of course, the, the 1967 Six-Day War, and then again in 1973 for the Yom Kippur War. Um, I would argue that this thing, Scott, is something new. Uh, what we're seeing, it, uh, terrorism has always been a, a, a strike or a raid. This, this was yeah. a terrorist invasion. Yes. Why are they so bold now in ways that have never, we've never seen before? Well, I think just kind of to go back and answer your original question, what's changed? Um, essentially, uh -huh. nothing has changed. Uh, yeah. Hamas has had this ambition from the beginning, and no matter what kinds of conversations have been had or public pronouncements have been made by any officials in that territory, uh, their intention was always to inflict maximum, maximum casualties um, on Israel. I think, in a sense, what changed was that Hamas adopted a different tactic. And instead of doing those isolated, explosive and little attacks here and there, or you know, trying to tunnel under the the fence, um, they decided to effectively do a low tech shock and awe. I mean, they went all Ewok on Israel and uh, did a number of things at the same time. You know, their legendarily inaccurate missiles. Instead of firing a couple of dozen of those, they fired hundreds and then thousands of those. Um, they attacked the border fence in 29 different areas. Uh, and a Apparently, at that point, the, the surveillance towers that Israel had set up to keep an eye on the border fence were poorly staffed, even though they have one of those every 500 feet along the, the fence of this, like, 40-mile fence. And so this is quite an elaborate thing. Um, 
And so they basically decided to go from from to air, land, water, bulldozers, paragliders, you know, and, and just did through everything at them at the same time. And if you've been dealing with this enemy for a long time, you don't think that they have that kind of capacity because they tend to you, you tend to think of them as a crazy isolationist who go out there and do a little bit here and a little bit there and try to cause a stir, but really are doing it more for PR. But this time they came in and they intended to inflict major casualties. And so I think long-term planning, logistics, supplies, money, organization, all of this had to be in place weeks, if not months earlier. Um, And this is not what the world thinks of when they think of these terrorists. We tend to think of them as marginalized in little cells and they're, you know, they're kind of operating on their own. But they found a way to network among those little cells without using any of the traceable networks. And even though Israel had the highest tech equipment available, I mean, I saw several Israelis uh, and government officials today uh, referring to this. They said, you don't understand. You think 700 people in your giant country is nothing, but it's the equivalent of 40,000 people in your country. That's the kind of, if proportionally, this is our 9-11, they kept saying. And, um, and, and not just killed in, 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 a, in an explosion, but murdered personally yes. in some of the worst in, in ways the imaginable. Can, door can to I just door. Say yeah, on, please, Bill. One thing on this issue. I think one thing I saw when I when I was watching like the rest of us just in amazement and 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 horror I think it's pretty clear to me that that this uh attack had learned a lot of lessons from from Ukraine. We saw Israeli hmm. tanks being taken out by drones that were dropped from yep. Ukraine which is a specific example but I don't think that's really the point. I think the larger example is in Ukraine, for example, now they're flying drones that cost five thousand dollars. They're made out of cardboard, and they can take out a ship or something that's worth millions of dollars. It is a way to what the Ukrainians have been doing, and clearly what Hamas has been doing, has been actively finding ways to to repurpose essentially off the shelf recreational yep. hardware and figure out how to turn it into weapons of war. I've never seen so many um, uh, powered parachutes in my life as I did that day, ever. And I've been to air shows where I've seen skies full. I've never seen that many of them. These things are inexpensive, and anyone can fly them. It's, there's really nothing to it. Yeah. And and this ability to, to think outside of the of the, the box is what allowed the sneak attack. It, the F-15 fighters that, that Israel has are have ensured that there are not going to ever be any flankers over uh, over uh, Israel. There's never going to be MiG-21s over Israel. There's never going to be, uh, you know, MiG-29s. There's never going to be any of that because Israel is prepared for that. I, I don't even know if it's possible to shoot down one of these things with, with a modern... Well, and as you're staring up at the sky, thousands of feet up in the sky, watching their incoming missiles blowing up, it was like they were thinking, hey, that wasn't the point. We just wanted you to stare up into the sky because while while your gaze is up there, we're coming in right over the horizon or on the ground. Yeah, It was brilliant. It was the most evil thing I think I've seen in my life, but there's no denying that it was absolutely tactically brilliant. I think it's the, the most horrific thing I've seen, and I also think it's the largest mistake I've ever seen any political group ever make in my life, yeah. but there's no denying the, 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 the they're, tactical they're going to pay for their Let me get into the mistake yeah. thing for, for just a moment, or maybe this is going to step on somebody else's toes, because I know we're all going to host segments on this this week, but the idea was to tempt Israel into committing uh, acts of war that could be portrayed as, as atrocities and make Israel the pariah. Um, Prior but, to this. But, but just today... Uh, the Ayatollah of Iran denied the uh, denied any responsibility. Oh no, we weren't involved in this. Yeah. Um, and even though Hamas said, "Oh yeah, we got all this help from from Iran," so that tells me that even in Tehran, that viper's nest of a government there, they know their plan backfired. Now, um, Scott, were were you finished, do we, or do we just stop? No. Yeah, I was just going to say, I agree with Bill, though. This is this was a militarily, tactically brilliant uh, move, and it's going to be their undoing. Um, it w- it yeah. will be effectively the end of Hamas uh, because 
they were so successful. Um, how do they follow this up? I mean, at this point, they're just shooting missiles over the border again, which Iron Dome is picking off with impunity. And so, you know, I don't know if there's a second wave attack. I remember after 9-11 here, we were all convinced there was going to be a second wave attack uh, that didn't come. But, um, you know, I, I think they've just signed their death warrant. Awakened uh, a sleeping giant and filled him yep. with a terrible resolve. Indeed. Indeed. And Israel declared war for the first time since 1973 as well. This this isn't another incursion like into southern Lebanon or anything like that. This this is the end of Hamas, and the IDF is going to make sure of that. I want to get back to the uh, – uh, has everybody had their say before I I'm done. wrap things yeah. up? Okay. Uh, I just want to get back to the Abraham Accords because they were a work of genius, absolutely a work of genius. Um, every other peace plan had failed – uh, with the exception, uh, every other Israeli-Palestinian peace plan had failed, starting with, with Bill Clinton in the 1990s and up through the present day. And the reason for that is the Palestinians, or at least their leadership, has not been interested in peace whatsoever. So there was no way to bring peace to the Middle East when your starting point is with the Palestinian leadership, because they didn't want peace. What, uh, what Mike Pompeo and Jared Kushner saw was that the Palestinians was the end place for the peace negotiations. That's where you wrapped things up. So they brought on one country after another in these bilateral agreements with Israel into these Abraham Accords, the idea being that you finish with the, with the, with the big daddy on the block, you finish with Saudi Arabia. And once the Saudis were on board with the Abraham Accords, then the Palestinians are, are essentially cut off and would have no choice but to finally, after all of these decades, to make peace with Israel. And it, it was absolutely genius for, for Pompeo and, and Kushner to turn the process on its head that way. And they delivered result after result after result. And I believe that if Trump had gotten that second term he deserved, uh, he and Pompeo would have gone down as just absolute foreign policy geniuses. And Pompeo, I think, is the best secretary of state we've had since George Shultz. And I thought George Shultz was a hell of a guy. He may get his chance to have a he, second term. He, he just might. So fingers crossed. What I This is all just a, all of this little history lesson from the late 20 teens is just to say this. About three months into the Biden administration, uh, White House spokes weasel Jen Psaki was asked uh, about the Abraham Accords and would the Biden administration continue with those negotiations. And she said, and I believe this is a word for word quote, those were the tactics of the prior administration. And we can see hmm. the bloody results all over southern Israel and the Gaza Strip today. That's what changed. That's your right angle on that, brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. For Bill and Scott, I'm Steve Green. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.